and gentlemen, here it is. The most listened to radio show on the planet. Even the other stations are tuned in too. Hi, this is Jake Toko with Rocky Mountain Construction, and you're listening to the Coaster Challenge Podcast. Hi, I'm Adam Floyd. I'm the Senior Marketing and Sales Manager at Wild Adventures Theme Park, and you're listening to the Coaster Challenge Podcast. Hi, this is Adam Sandy with Zamperla, and you're listening to the Coaster Challenge Podcast. Hi there, I'm Don Hurd, and I'm the Indiana Beach Historian and Vendor at the Park, and you are listening to the Coaster Challenge Podcast. Do you accept the Coaster Challenge? Yes, I accept the Coaster Challenge. Do you accept the Coaster Challenge? Coaster Challenge Podcast is here. It's time to face your fears. Get that theme park therapy and let us both your Coaster ears. Challenge Podcast is here. Your fear can disappear. We know that theme park therapy can drive all your tears. Do you accept the Coaster Challenge? Yes, I accept the Coaster Challenge. Do you accept the Coaster Challenge? We accept because you know we're not average. You're listening to the Coaster Challenge Podcast. A journey where people become fearful to fearless, all from riding roller coasters. So please secure your hats and glasses and keep your hands and arms inside the podcast. It's time to accept the Coaster Challenge with your host, Kim Dykes. Hi, this is Kim with the Coaster Challenge podcast. And today I am delighted to chat with a very unique guest. I am very happy to welcome Vince Overfield a coaster enthusiast that has made an impact on the Kings Island community by achieving over 2,000 rides on Orion. Thank you for joining me and welcome to the podcast, Vince. Hi there. How are you? I am wonderful. I am so happy that you have had time to join us. I'm ready to get started. We've had fun talking and getting to know each other, hanging out and getting last ride of the night many times on Orion at Kings Island. With that being said, I know about your love of coasters, but not much else about you. Will you please share a few things about yourself with our audience? Oh, well, I'm a restaurant manager and I like to travel, obviously. I love roller coasters and I plan my vacations around roller coasters now. That's good. I do the same thing. It leads to a happy life. <laughs> Is there anything else you'd like to share? Well, I have no kids, but I have a couple of nieces that love rollers that I bring with me from time to time. Okay. Any other hobbies or interests? I love sports. I'm a big Reds fan being here in Cincinnati, and I love Ohio State football. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Now, the way our interview is going to work, there's going to be two parts. The first part is what I call kind of the roller coaster time traveler, where we go back in time and talk about all of your experience. And then the last half of the interview is going to focus more on you individually here and now. So that's when we pretty much fast forward into today from the past. Okay, so jumping into the time traveling coaster machine what was the very first coaster that you remember riding the first real roller coaster i rode it was called the beastie at the time but now it's called woodstock express here at king's island that's the same one i rode i remember that i didn't get to ride very many when i was a kid because my family was petrified of everything and wouldn't let me ride a lot, but that was one that I remember riding and I rode it as many times as I could. So after that first coaster, thinking through all of the roller coasters you've ridden so far, what would you say is the one coaster that has scared you the most? Well, it's because I was so young, I was six years old and there's a roller coaster opened in 1979 called the Beast here at Kings Island. And I was afraid to walk up the path to ride it. So I didn't ride it until 1980. You got to ride the Beast that early on? Yes. I rode the Beast a lot later than you did. So I'm curious to know what kind of changes have you seen in the Beast over the years? The thing I noticed was the lack of trims. They used to not run trims at all back early on. 
any changes with the trains or anything or just the way that the ride I know they, they've changed the colors the lap bars have changed a little bit over the years but the beast is pretty much the way it's always been okay didn't there used to be water or something yeah there used to be water in there that when the vortex got built that water all disappeared so that's when they took the water out i did not know that very interesting uh, when i first got off the beast it, after that first ride it was i don't like to say it changed my life but i wasn't afraid of anything anymore like as far as coasters came okay so when you got off of it you weren't afraid of anything no i seven eight years old at the time. how were you feeling when you approached the station oh when we first got to the station i was holding my mom's hand, crying, didn't want to get on it. And then she told me I had no choice to get on it. So I got to listen to mom. <laughs> you are the second person I've talked to today that was pretty much forced <laughs> on, their first, on their first big scary coaster and absolutely loved it. And, you know, that can go definitely go one of two ways. You know, we've both been in a lot of amusement parks. Sometimes you see the kid getting forced on the ride and it goes well. Other times you see the kid getting forced on the ride and it, it doesn't go so well. I think the uh, one thing that really got uh, my daughter over her fear was when uh, we were down at Dollywood. It was back in 2019, I think. And um, she'd never ridden anything that had gone over 60 some miles an hour. I think she might have ridden. No, she hadn't even ridden the beast yet. But she was down there to ride Tennessee Tornado. And she was so excited, waited through the whole line. And then about saw the sign that it went 70 miles an hour and started freaking out like completely could not ride it paralyzed in fear like we drove four hours you said you were going to do this and now here you stand what are you doing and um the ride off told her they'd slow it down for her that got it on the ride that got her on the ride and then she rode it and she loved it and um then when she got off they told her that they were pretending they couldn't actually slow the ride down. <laughs> and that's what got her really over the hump and over the fear of quote unquote scary coasters. She wasn't afraid of anything after that. So um, thinking back to that first ride on the beast, yeah, I know you said you weren't scared of anything when you got off of it. Would you say that it impacted your life after riding that coaster? And if so, what impacts did it have? Made me more confident in things. Because after I rode that, I wasn't, like, it gave me a lot of lack of fear of things at, at that point. You know, that's one of the things I've noticed, too. I've talked with so many of my guests about. It's strange. Once that fear's overcome, I personally have found it branching off into so many different things that I didn't even realize, you know, could happen as a process of facing and overcoming fear. One, one big story I always share with all of my guests is, you know, fear is in the mind. It's all here. Weight loss. People ask me, how in the world did you literally lost You're a whole person? How did you do that? It's here. It's in the mind. So once you learn to once you learn to conquer your mind in one situation, I can conquer my mind in every situation. I used to be, you know, very. I used to be very codependent. Would not ever stand up for myself. Wouldn't stand up for anybody else. You know, when it needed to be done. And it's it's just strange. It's like just out of nowhere. There's been random situations present themselves, and without even thinking about it or batting an eye, I can do exactly what I need to do, handle it very well, and not be upset that I did it. 
And that's all, you know, I tie it all back to roller coasters, tie it all back to that and just letting go of fear and anxiety that's in my mind and realizing, Hey, you've got your mind in check when you're 400 feet in the air, you've got your mind in check anyway. All right, let's continue thinking about all of your different amusement parks you visited, different coasters you've ridden. What would you say has been your craziest moment on a coaster? I mean, this can be riding a coaster, standing in line for a coaster, you know, at a park or wherever. I think the craziest experience I had was on Millennium Force. We begged the write-offs to send us out in an absolute downpour. And when we got into that break run, I absolutely regretted every part of that decision because I had so many red dots on my arms, my face, and I was soaked. Oh, wow. <laughs> that, <laughs> I've had some fun, painful rides, but I don't know. Would, would you say that that was fun? Did you like it? It was fun, but it was very painful. And it also became nerve wracking. Because Millennium Forces breaks, I've ridden it enough times to know how it's supposed to stop, uh-huh. and we did not stop correctly. We slid in. Oh my! God. <laughs> I've had some crazy rain rides, but I don't think I've ever had one <laughs> quite like that. And I've never left with marks on my body, so <laughs> you get the trophy for that one. I've shared, I think my craziest rain ride ever was back in 2020 on Orion when we had to wear the mask. It didn't rain a drop the whole day and uh, we were waiting for last train and it started pouring. I mean, like a monsoon about five or 10 minutes before we got on, you know, and everybody went flooding out of line. And we're <laughs> like, well, we're going to get soaked. Go on to the car, so you they may as well just stay here and ride. Oh, boy. The kids, that was, you know, when we had to do only two per row on Orion with the social distancing. They rode in the front. I took the back row. That whole ride, I, you know, I got to wear glasses. I can't see anything. I couldn't see anything anyway. My glasses were all fogged up. They, I could, I was blind. The water went up my mask and it went up my nose. <laughs> I could not breathe. Oh, God. I got off that thing. The first thing I did was start spewing water <laughs> out of my nose. And um, we had puddles of shoot, water in my shoes. It was, I was a mess. We laughed all the way to the car. That was one of the most fun rides I think we've ever had on any coaster anywhere. Just that whole story. And then we walked into Speedway looking like drowned rats and everybody was staring at us. (laughs) I actually looked at one lady. I said, take a picture. It'll last longer. And I turned around and went on my way. (laughs) That was a fun night. Okay. So, um, of all of the coasters you've ridden, I think I know the answer to this question without asking, but I'm going to ask anyway. What is your favorite coaster? My favorite coaster is actually a Velocicoaster down at Universal. Ooh, I didn't know the answer. <laughs> Interesting. So what makes Velocicoaster your favorite coaster? What do you love about it? I like that it had a bunch of elements that I like. I like speed. It's got some speed. It's got a little bit of airtime, and it has got some inversions too. So it had a little bit of everything. So right now it's my number one. I don't know if it'll stay my number one, mm-hmm. but yeah, you know, a lot of more coasters to ride. The Mosasaurus roll is incredible. It was personally my favorite inversion until. I experienced the death roll on Iron Quasi, which I preferred better. But I mean, Velocicoaster for me, it was it was my number one for a while. And then I rode Iron Quasi. That was before I rode Iron Quasi. Rode Iron Quasi. 
That moved up to number one. Velocicoaster moved down to number two. Then I rode Voyage Unchained for the third year in a row. This year at Hollywood Nights with the track work they had done. That thing was running faster than I think should even legally be allowed at, the, <laughs> at that event. And, um, and I mean, it's so dark. Those night rides, you can't even see your hand in front of your face. It is black as pitch the whole ride. Uh, it's out of, I tell everybody that's never experienced it's an out of body experience. The back row is where you got to be. It's, but there's not a bad seat on that train. But um, after Hollywood Nights this year, Voyage moved back up <laughs> to my number two under our Nguazi. So now Velocicoaster sitting at number three. Now, me being me, that might change. <laughs> I go ride Velocicoaster again. We're always joking about my goat coaster list and how it hey, changes your goats sometimes. Tends to change on a dime. <laughs> but um, it's basically the same coasters that stay up there. They just move around. But with new parks, Pantheon got added to my goat list. And I'm going on my East Coast trip. I'm actually leaving tomorrow. So I'm very excited. As much as I love Voyage, I am beside myself with excitement for El Toro. It's something I have just dreamed of riding for years. I've never been there. So we're going to Six Flags Great Adventure. I'm going to Hershey Park. Dorney and Knobles and getting doing some credit stops on this trip. The East Coast has so much. That's probably going to have to be divided up. And I'm thinking into probably three separate trips to ride everything that's there because there's so many little credit stops and stuff too. There's just no way I have time to do it all in one big swoop. We're actually planning a Northeast trip next year to get, you know, some of the areas up North that we're not going to be able to get this year and cross hopefully over into Canada to do Canada's Wonderland on that trip next year as well. And I'll finally have ridden all of the gigas if I can get there. Looking forward to that. So, Velocicoaster is your favorite coaster. Of all the coasters you've ridden, on the flip side of the coin, what is your least favorite coaster? Son of Beast is my least favorite coaster. Ooh. I know there's going to be some KI people not happy about that. That's a hot take. If I've ever heard one. When did you write it? I wrote it three times total. I wrote it twice the opening year and then once the next year, and that was enough. I You didn't even like it when it opened? No, it was rough from day one. See, I wrote it with the loop, and I never got to write it without the loop. And I heard that literally it was when all hell broke loose on that ride after the loop came out that it got just very unbearably rough. I did not experience that. But keep in mind, I wasn't at Kings Island that much back then, you know, a couple times a year at most, maybe once. So it wasn't something I experienced a lot, but I remember when I wrote it, I loved it. And I wrote it multiple times when I was there at the park. But like you said, I I think that was one. It was a great idea before its time. Yeah, I think it was poorly manufactured and then. Yeah, cheap wood. Yeah, cheap wood all led to massive failure. Yeah. If only that concept could be brought back to life. Yeah, by someone that knows what they're doing. Yeah. Now. That would be. An incredible idea. And I know there's a lot of Kings Island people you see on the pages. If they would ever do an RMC Son of Beast, there'd be a lot yeah. of people really happy, including myself. I wouldn't fuss about that at all. Okay. So now we're going to fast forward in the time traveler to the year 2022 and Orion. Let's start with your current ride count. How many rides do you currently have on Orion? Well, as of this afternoon, I'm currently at 2,499. 
Oh my goodness. You've gotten almost 500 more rides since I saw you <laughs> the last time I was there. About how many rides do you get a day? I currently this year, I'm only averaging 13 a day, but like today I've already done 25 rides. So do you come every day? I've missed five days all season. Oh my goodness. So you- you just show up after work or whenever and ride when you can. Yeah, I I, I hate missing days though this year because it's just I miss, I miss the park. Yep. <laughs> you sound like me with there's certain things even with like exercise. If I miss too many days of exercise, that's one of the things about my summer travel that's been driving me crazy. I've gotten out of my fitness routine. So <laughs> I've got one week, one week left, my bit, next big trip of, of my hoo hawing. And then <laughs> when I've been home, I, I get back, you know, I'm doing my workouts and stuff, but I'm like, the second I get home, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm doing. <laughs> it, it drives me crazy if I stay out of the habit for too long. Bugs me tremendously. So before you started writing, Orion, was there another coaster that you rode this many times before Orion was built, or is this the first one? Orion is the first one I've like really ridden a bunch, but I've always thought about doing this on Millennium Force if I live closer to Sandusky. And why would it be Millennium Force? That for the longest time was my favorite roller coaster, so it was my dream to just marathon it. Oh, okay. So what what's inspired you when you started riding Orion? What's inspired you to keep riding it and to start counting your rides? There was a ride up. She still works on Orion. Her name's Kelly Stockman, I believe is her last name. Uh-huh. And she started asking me how many rides I had. And I told her, she's like, oh, you're going to hit your goal. I, I told her my goal opening year was 250 rides. I was like, well, I really wanted to do 300, but I don't think I can. Mm -hmm. And she's like, oh, you can do it. You can just go for it. Yeah. So. So what is it that you love about Orion that makes you want to keep writing it and not get bored with it? I love that it's rewritable. It's very smooth. I I actually find it right. Riding Orion and relaxing. I get that so much. And I, I get it on Orion. And I, that, that takes me back to my, one of my recent trips, my day on Fury. I'm, I'm committed to making one trip a year to do nothing except ride Fury. And this year I got drug away from Fury for a little while. By my daughter, wanting to go do other stuff. I'm like, next year, I've already decided you're going to be 14 years old. You got your phone. Here's your debit card. I'm camping out here all day. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just so, the B&M gigas are just so graceful and they flow and they're so easy to ride. I mean, when I ride Fury, I just feel like I'm flying or dancing along. It's and they com- last year Fury was developing a rattle, yeah. and they they completely rebuilt the trains. The rattle's gone; it's running like new. And There's, it's the little three click rides where you're flying out of your seat. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just the best. Any stress you have. Any worries you have, any any negative energy at all in your life, every time you just lift out of that seat, it's gone. Yep. <laughs> it's just <laughs> completely gone. And that's one of the things I love about the BM gigas too. I mean, Orion, Orion is my nostalgic favorite. You know, that's the one where I I've never done what you've done and counted the rides. I know I've had hundreds, I've, but I travel so much. I wouldn't have anywhere near as many as you have, but you know, just the memories and the stories that I have with all the friends that I've got, you know, at Kings Island and stuff around that coaster. Orion's not, you know, in my top list of goat coasters, but it's, yeah. well, that's it's it. my number one. I don't one even know if it's in my coaster. top 10, but 
Yeah, but just the one I ride the most. And I one of the my one of my favorite experiences is when you show up during morning morning ERT and you get you know those early morning rides. You're like practically on a train by yourself, or you know just a few people, and they're so quiet and relaxing. That's something I can just do over and over again. That's you know why we, when we come, I I always come for the full day, and part of it is so that I can experience that. You know, the park's not quiet; you're not crowded yet. It's quiet. It's just very peaceful. Okay, so what has I guess kind of inspired you to keep going? What motivates you to keep going and not? stop now it's kind of i almost feel like i have to it's almost like a job now i have to ride orion because people know me over there it's like i need to go yeah they ask me where i'm at when i'm not there and you know that is one of the things i love about the king's island community i used to watch when a long time ago i don't watch i hardly ever watch tv anymore but um it reminded me of that old show, Cheers. Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. <laughs> and it really is. Anytime I show up at the park, even if I haven't told a soul that I'm coming, there's always going to be <laughs> somebody <laughs> around the corner. And then, not, you know, nine times out of ten, I wind up talking to people and you know riding with people and things that i didn't even know was going to happen that day and the whole over at orion and the whole king's island community it's really become like family and i yeah. you know i can see people that i haven't seen in months and it's like i just saw them yesterday and i mean we pick right back up where we left off and that's you know, that's what, fa to me, that's what, you know, family and friends are. And I've never experienced anything like that at any other park. Now, you know, I've traveled other parks, but we've got Kentucky Kingdom 10 minutes away from us. And I don't feel that there at all. I feel it when I go to Kings Island and it's what we call our home away from home. Okay, so... What year did you, you, did you start doing this the year that Orion opened? Yeah, I started my rides in 2020. I was at the first rider event. Okay. The marathoning didn't really start till the following year in 2021. And that's when I started doing 30, 35 a day. Okay. And the ride offs were in shock when I hit a thousand two days after Orion's birthday. That's interesting that you were at the first rider event. You'll meet him here in a bit, but my executive producer, David, he was the very first first writer yeah. <laughs> at that event. David Cantu was. Um, how has doing this, you know, just marathoning Orion and continuing to show up and do this as much as you can, how has this impacted your life? It seems like a lot more people know me now. Like I have strangers come up to me in the park. I have no clue who they are. And they're like, <laughs> Are you the Orion guy? I'm like, yeah, I guess. <laughs> so you've become famous. You kind of made, kind of made your own little. I could, well, it wasn't, like I wasn't trying to get in a like newspaper or anything like that, but uh -huh. people pay attention to my posts. I'm like, okay. <laughs> well, and you know, one of the things I've learned through some of the darndest stuff I've done just for myself is you have impacts on people that you don't realize that you have um personal connection I can make there is you know we did our family interview before I was ever a part of this podcast my family interviewed with David and Andrew Back, it was last September, I think, we did the interview. And my interview aired on uh, New Year's Eve. And on the interview, I shared my story with, you know, 
why, you know, part of the story I shared was why I lost weight, how I found the motivation to go from a size, almost size 26 to the size four that I am now, you know, how did you not get discouraged? How did you keep going? And the whole, you know, my whole, my whole motivation at first was to fit on millennium force. I knew I couldn't fit the seatbelt. I wasn't going to go to Cedar point till I could, you know, that's what started it. And that was about 60 pounds ago that I fastened that seatbelt for the first time, you know, and then after that, it became, okay, you've come this far, but your knees and feet are still hurting. So you're not done yet, you know, <laughs> get it going. And uh, what really shocked me was just from that one interview, the number of people, not that it just have contacted me over social media. I have people stop me at Kings Island that recognize me and they stop and tell me how I've inspired them. One guy stopped me the last time I was there. His name's Bill. You might know him. He rides around a lot of time in a motorized cart and he was in tears. He said, guess what? He said, you'll never guess what I did. He said, I finally fit on Banshee today. And it's because of you. And I just, I got emotional. <laughs> And I said, you know, I said, here's what I want to tell you. I said, that's your first step. I said, now keep going and do what you're doing. Because one of these days, you're not going to be riding around the spark. You're going to be walking and who knows, might be marathoning with us one of these days, running around that station, you know, up and down the steps. You can do anything you decide you want to do. But, you know, it just, it's really humbled me. And that's why for a lot of people that I'm friends with and stuff, people have said, ask me, like, keep posting your, your fitness post, your progress post, because there's people that watch this and they're inspired by it and the, it's helped them to make a change. So, you know, that's why when the opportunity came to join the podcast, I was like, well, you know, if I were able to help this many people from one interview, I could help a lot more yeah. if I'd be able to, you know, talk with other people, get other people to share their stories. You know, people can be inspired by you. People can be inspired by me. It's, you know, it's a very, but a positively contagious sort of thing. And it's, it's very humbling at the same time. <laughs> I'm sure when people come up to you at Kings Island and you're a big deal. Yeah, <laughs> to me it's not a big deal, but to them it is. <laughs> it's like, yeah, and you just you don't know how the little interactions like that, the little stuff, the fact that you even stop to talk to somebody that day, you know how it affects them later on. That's you know stories that I've shared with. I was sharing with the uh, coaster kids the other night. Was you know my son when he first came to into the community, he, he actually drug me to our first coaster kids meet up. I was very reluctant. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I was very overweight, very depressed, very antisocial. And my son was depressed. He was actually suicidal for over six months. He couldn't be left by himself. I mean, our life was just a mess for a while, long time after some things that had happened. And uh, he, I was told Billy the other night when I was interviewing him for Coaster Kids, I said, it was the fact that you guys took the time to talk to him. I said, you know, the first time Jay went to a Coaster Kids meetup, he stood and hid behind me and was shaking like a leaf because he was so, he had no confidence. He was always bullied at school. He was made fun of like crazy. And he's like, you know, why if they don't like me? Well, I, I just don't know. I said, the fact that you took the time to, you know, talk to him and include him. And he actually, Jay actually became 
best friends with Logan's number one sidekick back then. It was the number one Coaster Kids fan, Tyler Winnick. When Tyler came into an amusement park, 500 kids would know who he was. You know, oh my God, there's Tyler, there's Tyler. He was, I still pick on Tyler. He's a good friend of Jay's. We meet up with him and his dad multiple times a year. I call it, I'm like, oh, it's the Coaster Kids celebrity. And he's like, you're on a podcast. We're like, who's more famous? You know, we, we joke around about it. But the fact that those kids took the time to just even interact with him and get to know him, they saved his life. They didn't just help him, they saved his life. That was what made the change, you know, and they didn't realize it. Just inviting him to meet up here or stopping, you know, talking to him when they saw him. And just taking the time to get to know him, it, I, I don't even know what else to say. And I don't think, you know, they thought about that when there were a hundred other kids around and they were taking time to include my son, that it would have, you know, that level of impact on him. And um, Tyler's dad, John, He's the one that I still credit to this day. He's the one that flipped the switch for me because I was just, I was in a five-year slump after my mom died. And I just was a shell. I couldn't get out of the depression I was in. And uh, Tyler's dad just, I don't know, he saw something in me that I didn't see it myself. And he kept inviting me to things. And I'm like, why do they want to invite me? Nobody ever invites me to anything. And I slowly but surely kept going because Jay wouldn't let me say no. <laughs> he wanted to go see the other kids. And I, you know, a little bit at a time started to trust adults <laughs> and talk to adults. And I had something I never really had a lot of before. I had friends. And now <laughs> the person, the people, the person that people know now that's me, they're like, you're actually quiet. You're shy. I'm like, you have no idea. But, you know, it was the community that brought the community he kind of got me involved with that brought me to where I am now. And that's my whole purpose for being on this podcast is to try to give back to the community what's been brought to me because it's been life-changing in every way and I'm sure that you are affecting lives too maybe more than you realize when you stop and have those interactions with people so let's move on to our next question when you are at King's Island on those rare occasions that you're not riding Orion, what are some of the other things that you enjoy doing at the park? Well, obviously I enjoy a lot of the other coasters. Mystic Timbers is probably my second favorite here. And I actually really love the 70s on demand show they have this year with the 50th anniversary. I've watched it about 30 times already. They have got some fantastic shows there this year i particularly enjoyed the uh phantom theater show that they put on I love that too. and then over the rails is amazing where they do all those stunts that's one i want to try to see the next time i come back i haven't seen that yet i did finally get to see the uh fireworks with the lasers and everything the drones it was absolutely phenomenal I've actually taken the time not to do last ride on Orion just to watch the fireworks up front. <laughs> I ask you if you've done that because that when the last time I was there, that was one of the few times I didn't go back there. I went up front, but thankfully the park was open later that night. So I got to go do some more things anyway, but even I didn't even realize the park was open late. I've been running around so much. I didn't even know the park hours. Until <laughs> it was like, oh, the park's still open. Oh, okay. Let's go right after the fireworks. Cause I thought we were going to be done after that. 
But uh, so we got to go ahead and go ride anyway, which was nice. But even if the park was going to close at that time, I was going up front to see that because I just don't think you would get the full yeah. effect from the back of the park. It's been compared to Disney. My friend Andrew that lives in Florida, he's actually the other executive producer of this podcast. He says it's not quite Disney level, but it's really close. He absolutely loved it. Yeah, I saw Disney's and I've seen King's Islands. Now I need to go back and see Disney's again because I think <laughs> it's right on par. Yeah, that sounds like me with my roller coasters. One will move up. <laughs> Don't go on the other one again. I'm like, shoot, now I need to. One thing that was neat this year was I got to ride, and I've never done this. I got to ride Intimidator 305, Fury, Orion, and Millennium Force all in a week. So it was the first time I could really compare the rides and get an accurate ranking that I felt comfortable with. Because, you know, it's like the fireworks shows or anything else. When there's large gaps in between it, it's hard to remember what was better. And But when you get to do it back to back like that, those occasions are rare. You <laughs> finally get to figure everything out. Okay. So let's move to our next question. Would you consider yourself more of an Orion enthusiast, a coaster enthusiast, or a Kings Island enthusiast? I think I'm more of a coaster enthusiast, but I'm definitely a Kings Island fanboy. Because being in my home park, I walk around here and I give, I tell people like how to find places in the park and stuff like that. So, so you're kind of an ambassador of sorts as well. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe a KI ambassador. Maybe that should be my role. Yeah, I'll we'll see if we can get you a side job and get you hired on. Oh, they, they're yeah. recruiting me. <laughs> I bet they are. They could put your face on a poster and everybody's going to know who you are. <laughs> okay, so regarding coasters and amusement parks, what are some of the bucket list items on your list? Where are places you want to go and coasters you want to ride? I, I want to get out west. I haven't. I've been to Six Flags Magic Mountain, but I was about four years old, so I don't remember that. And that park has changed a lot, so I need to get out there. Obviously, Twisted Colossus and West Coast Racers, all their little mm -hmm. ride. So I guess what would you say is your top, if you had, you know, a top one or two bucket list coasters, are those it, or are there other coasters you would want to ride? Uh, the California trip would be my top my second would be i want to go to dubai because i gotta ride formula rosa the, uh, wear the goggles mm -hmm. possibly get blinded by the sand and <laughs> face but for me the california trip oh that's a bittersweet topic i was originally of course i'm a teacher i'm a planner so I, I literally start talking about next year's trips like this summer. I've already been talking about next year's trips and starting to get a map in my head of where we're going, how many trips. You know, I've, I've done this long enough now. I know how many trips I can make during my time off. <laughs> you know, So I'm starting to get a, a sketch in my mind of where we're going next year. It's, you know, places we haven't been. And in order for that to happen, I have to remind myself to stay out of Florida for a while <laughs> because I would go down there all the time if I could not stay. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to I'm going to I need to wait, wait on that a little bit because there's so much happening down in Florida. I'm waiting until there's more that's finished down there to go back, you know, to be able to really make a bang for the trip. But next year, originally, we wanted to go to California, but flight rates everything has just shot through the roof i went i flew to florida last october and it was fine and then you know along with everything else flight rates have just gone astronomically high and then you get i see all these horror stories of people with layovers 
And, you know, you lose, can lose significant time off your trip with that, all these canceled flights and stuff. But then there's the whole other issue of the rental car. Number one, the cost. And number two, the shortage is very real. I found that out through the car accident I was in. I'm actually supposed to get my car back, fingers, toes, arms, and legs crossed next week, I hope. But um, the rental car shortage is unreal. And it would be my worst nightmare. I can't navigate anything anyway. It's horrible. Even with the GPS, it's a... Always in question where I'm going to wind up before we get where we're going. But um, that's a whole other side story. But uh, my worst nightmare would be to show up at a, you know, airline. You're supposed to get your rental car. And, uh, yep, we're all out of cars. Yep. And that's happening nationwide and a whole lot of, a whole lot of places. So, you know, combined with the cost and all of that, I'm holding off on California. But next year is going to be all places I can drive to that we haven't been. And there's a lot still to explore. And uh, my bucket list coasters, I've got two that really stand out in my head that I have to get to before I die. The first one would be Zadra to see if it beats Iron Gwazi. And the other one's Ride to Happiness because I, 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 that's, I, I love Time Traveler. Next year is going to be my year that I return to Silver Dollar City because they didn't get to have night rides on Time Traveler and Outlaw Run. The park closed, I think, at like seven the last time we went. And Time Traveler, well, Outlaw Run too, it's great. It's my number three RMC overall under Iron Quasi and Still Vengeance. But uh, I've not had enough rides on Time Traveler. I need more. But Ride to Happiness looks like Time Traveler on speed. If I could somehow, I've got to wait till the kids are grown and can pay their own way to be able to do that. But that is something that's definitely... On my list of places in Formula Rest, it wouldn't be too bad either. <laughs> I think that would be probably the most bizarre, unique experience one could wish to have in their lifetime. The goggles, the whole nine yards just look almost like it shouldn't even be allowed to happen. <laughs> That's what makes it fun. Okay. Um, so our next question is going to center around advice. And this can be advice about anything. You know, just thinking about people in general. It could be, you know, whether they're thinking about riding a coaster for the first time or whether it's in their personal life, you know, thinking of, you know, fear of making a change, anything at all. What kind of advice would you give to those that are listening I, as far as my advice for go, people going to amusement parks is fanny packs and cargo shorts are okay. Yes. And be nice to the ride ops. I see too many people just being rude to these ride ops and then they wonder why the ride ops are mean to them. Thank you. Thank you for bringing like that. <laughs> <laughs> the ride ops, I mean, they're the messengers. They're doing their job. Yeah. Be nice to them. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, here's something that really that got my attention. You know, enthusiast. And I'm one, too. Boy, am I. I will. I will ride the line as hard as I can ride it when it comes to airtime. I mean, and it's not just on Orion. Those RMCs, anything. I mean, I want to, I, if I can get my arms under the restraint, it's going to be one hell of a ride. <laughs> That's how I ride. Um, unless the airtime's painful. And if the airtime's painful, then it's not a goat coaster. It's going down on my list. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I noticed when I went back to Carowinds this year, 
they were putting the restraints down on Fury a lot more than they were last year. And it was actually McLean that told me somebody somewhere on social media posted a picture of their restraint and it was completely fine. They had the three clicks, you know, that are required for the B&M gigas. He said it was a popular YouTuber or somebody and it got put out on self, social media. And it's like, he was just like, basically, you know, this is going to be one hell of a ride. That was pretty much the post, right? Well, the entire, I guess, in light of the Icon Park incident and different stuff, the entire Fury crew got their butts chewed out for letting people do that. And they were basically told it was dangerous. So the Fury crew started stapling, is what McLean told me. And he, it was so bad, he didn't ride for a while. He quit riding. But um, they are not doing it that that extreme now. But you're not getting the three clicks either. It's kind of in the middle. But they're the last bit. And I'm sure there are a lot of people not happy about that. But, you know, the last thing you want to be do is standing there chewing them out because it's not their fault. And I've seen enthusiasts do that. A number of times at a number of parks. And it's best if they're doing what they have to do to just let it be because they're yeah. most of them want you, they want you to have a good ride. <laughs> so yeah. Arguing with them and shouting at them is, and most of them are kids. It's not doing more really than making you look like a self-entitled fool in my opinion <laughs> it's like you said treat people the way you want to be treated and they're going to treat you that way back most of the time yep all right so our last question is just about social media where are you available to be found on social media if people want to learn more about the incredible Orion guy, Vince Overfield. Well, I'm on Facebook at just Vince Overfield. And then I'm at, on Instagram at just Vincent. It's, I'm sorry, Vince.Overfield at Instagram. Okay. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to join me out of your Orion marathoning. And, um, I very much enjoyed our conversation. Thank you for being my guest today. Thank you. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And if you want to see more of us, we upload every Friday. And check us out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, all at Coaster Challenge. Links are in the description below. Thanks for joining us here today.